Good morning. Good to see each of you. Um, trust you have a handout. If you don't, wave, wave your hand and Richard will get you one. His house closing has been moved to the 19th, so I'll be praying about that. And uh, for Pastor Miller, who's preaching, has preached seven times this week, preaching three times today. And um, I know he'll be glad to come back. Somebody approached him about another conference up there in September, and he said, just hang on a little bit. <laughs> Look at my schedule first. He's already got two commitments in September. So pray for Pastor Miller. He's got a, a lot on him as our interim pastor. And uh, he asked me in a phone call yesterday, he said, uh, Paul, how did the meeting go? I said, which one? I've been to like four this week. <laughs> so... <laughs> So uh, he's been in a lot more uh, in his time. So uh, it's, it's a joy to be able to uh, share the word with you today and to continue to look into the word. I appreciate the message by Pastor Jeriel. I have to turn my hearing aids on fast listen and uh, gets a lot in. And so I appreciate that. And Richard, I'll have you close the door, leave it a little gap in the door, if you will, there for Barbara. And uh, I'm thankful that she continues to come. Uh, I'll put a shout out here for you, won't I, Barb? It's all right. Don't put on strong perfume, ladies or cologne men, and sit near her. She cannot tolerate it. So that's a physical issue. And uh, we don't, I know she probably didn't want me to tell you that, but uh, uh, that's why she sits there. And that's why we leave the door a little bit cracked so she can get some air. And uh, good to see each of you. I know different ones. Uh, have different uh, struggles and even getting here on a Sunday morning. So I uh, pray for you and throughout the week and thankful that we can uh, open God's Word today. We are in a difficult book uh, <laughs> with difficult language. So we looked at Hosea's faithless wife as we read that God told him to go take a wife in verse 2 of the first chapter and children of whoredoms because why the land the land had committed great whoredom departing from the Lord so that's the backdrop of what we are looking at in in Hosea that was the first strange command so we're going to fast forward and and the book I've chosen not to take it verse by verse, so we're doing a lot of jumping because those are the themes that, that we need to follow. And today we'll look at the Lord's faithless people, and we are jumping forward before we'll go back a little bit to chapter 3 where the Lord gives a second strange command. And the Lord, then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman... Beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, kind of a pause here, according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So he is basically being told to go marry. There's some discussion, of course, by those who uh, look for books, um, things to write books about about whether this is a different woman, I, I believe it's the same woman, and he is told to go bring her back and to love her in spite of herself and her actions. Now my question is, how does a marriage covenant, and we're getting ready to have our first granddaughter married in August, and uh, how does that kind of a, a sweet love um, digress, slip, from exclusive intimacy and love with departure and then betrayal? Was it the allurement of a, another man, excitement of a changed lifestyle, for Gomer to switch her affections from her husband and even her children? I've often thought, well, maybe a woman could leave a man. She's not treated right, right but to see the maternal instincts be totally obliterated also it's amazing. It's amazing what sin can do to any of us. So Gomer's moral decline, perhaps starting out as promiscuous adultery, 
but then it declines into prostitution. And she lost her liberty. We don't know and don't have all the details, but she ends up evidently being owned, being a sex slave, and has to be purchased out of that lifestyle. Robert G. Lee, and this has been attributed to more than one person, said, sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And that's true. Um, and so we have to be on guard in our lives. The decisions made by Gomer are just a reflection. They're just mirrored by Israel. That's what Israel had done with God. They had, the nation had directly turned away from him. Now God suffers when his people reject him. In the New Testament we read about when we do what to the Holy Spirit when we sin? Grieve. We grieve. We grieve him. What's another word that's used? Quench. So those two descriptive terms in Ephesians and 1 Thessalonians describe what, what happens when we, when we sin to God who dwells, indwells us. And Hosea, Hosea agonized over the infidelity of his wife but I believe he began to understand as he looked deep into the heart of God. And that's what I'm calling us to do as we look at this book. We sometimes tend to say, I don't want to say glibly, but maybe lightly, God is love. Do you find yourself repeating that or quoting <clears throat> it or thinking of it? And it isn't really a weighty subject. It, it is something that we don't, it's just easy to say, and it's easy to repeat. But we forget that it is couched within the Jonine arguments, and I would say in First John we have the argument or the presentation of our birth certificate. Um, and we look at fellowship, the conditions in chapter 1 of fellowship, the conduct of fellowship, the characteristics in chapter 3 of fellowship, the cautions in chapter 4, and the consequences in chapter 5. So I've challenged to those who are not sure of the faith that they have to read this book and take the test. It's there. It's there. You can do it by reading First John. Um, and, and understand whether you have been born again or not. And so Hosea's experiences instructed him that outraged love of God causes unimaginable pain. So when God's love is scorned, God suffers. God suffers pain. In the second part, as we go back to Hosea chapter 3, Verse 1 says, according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit as we first discover what Israel had, had done to God, to the Lord. So Hosea, he's told to go and regather this scattered person, his wife, Jezreel, the son He's told to go bring back the unloved, a mirror of that lo Rama. And then lo Ami, not mine, bring back that one. That Israel has both been scattered, declares they're not mine and don't really love me. Bring them back and love. So the Lord's faithless people. Now it's undisputable that that uh, Israel was chosen by God, not of their own merits. Um, they were chosen because of God's love for them. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, the Lord says, You're a holy or a set-aside people unto the Lord thy God. God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are on the face of the earth. 
and he has not retracted that. So we must understand Israel has a special place in God's heart. How did God demonstrate that love? In, in so many ways, but we'll just draw attention to the Exodus. As the Lord took his people out of bondage, uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8, it talks about the Lord's love. Because the Lord loved you, because he would keep the oath he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the house of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Reminds us that we were once bought, purchased, redeemed, taken out of the slavery of sin and set on a new path. And so the Lord told them in, in Deuteronomy 8, chapter 2, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. And for what reason? What are the words that he uses there in Deuteronomy 8, 2? What was the purpose of the wilderness wandering? Anybody have it there? To humble them. To humble them. So uh, the counterpart of being humble? Yeah, they were probably proud, sort of like us, right? And to do what? Prove or to test you. And what was that test going to reveal? <laughs> God's always after the heart, isn't he? And we are so blind to our own heart, our hearts when we, um, when we sin. And whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or not. So the Lord used that test as he led them. The four marks of the reasons for why God took them through the wanderings. I like hot weather, but when I heard it was going to be 117 in Las Vegas, um, maybe it'll short circuit some of those machines. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> um, that's hot. 130, I think, in Death Valley. Breaking records. Um, yeah, I like hot weather, but not, not that hot. What was it like being in the desert? Uh, just carrying what you could carry, and even carrying things you didn't want to carry, like uh, Joseph's bones uh, with no water, not much food, but God. God provided. God gave them what they needed. And uh, the Lord says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Verse 9. He's always reminding his people of, of his work in their lives. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, who would read verses 9 through 12? If you have that, please. Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 12. The Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found them in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him and kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Wow. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. There's a lot there, isn't it? The people are God's portion. The chosen. He provided, He protected, and He prepared them. And He did it by Himself. He didn't need help. The strange gods, uh, idols that they unfortunately turned to. The Lord God. Joshua said, You've seen all that the Lord God hath done to these nations because of you, because the Lord God is He that fought for you. So we look over our lives, as um, I do occasionally, uh, especially on my birthday, realize uh, the African statement, where I've come from is a long way, and where I'm going is pretty close. Um, we don't know how much time we have left, but what a joy to receive a text from a grandson who's pretty busy in camp, 
and just remembering little things that uh, we've shared over the years and uh, thankful to see grandchildren now walking in the faith and, and following God and excited about serving God. But Israel, Israel had committed whoredom, departing from the Lord. How did they do it? Well, we've already seen um, in multiple ways, but in chapter 2 it mentions uh, something which we will get into a little bit more next week when we look at, um, look at uh, Bless Be the Tie. We'll be talking about marriage next week, so um, I'm giving you a warning. Um, Hosea chapter 2, verse 2, is talking about the children. Plead with your mother, plead, for she's not my wife, neither am I her husband. So uh, total separation, some would use the D word, I don't like using it. She said, chapter 2, verse 5, I will go after my lovers. Verse 13, she went after her lovers and, and forget me, saith the Lord. So this is talking about Israel. Again, paralleled in, in Hosea and Gomer's life. And they've gone a-whoring from under their God. So from out from under his authority. No respect for his, his ownership. They have done treacherously, chapter 5, verse 7, against the Lord. Woe to them, for they have fled from me. And I think it sums it up in chapter 10, verse 2. Their heart is divided. A divided heart. That's a tough thing. If you've worked with young people or have some connection with them today, I think too often we look at the outside of what's going on and we forget that all of that comes from the heart and so we see a rotten piece of fruit on the tree and we want to pull it off and throw it away we correct them in one area or another and then we see more and more fruit coming out the same way and we forget we've got to go to the root <laughs> we've got to go down to the heart because that's where these Decisions are being made and that's where these actions are flowing from the same thing with God. So Israel departed now Where did that departure begin in the heart? But it was also Israel's leadership Who are the leaders that are mentioned here that have departed? From God Do you have them there call them out for me if you will? The prophet, the priests, the rulers, the king, princes. So everything was quoted to me when I was in school. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And so we are praying, aren't we? Because we need a shepherd in our church. Our Open Door Baptist Missions needs a director and we've begun a serious uh, selection process so pray for that in Acts 13 when the first pastors were sent out to be what we call today missionaries what did the church do they prayed and they fasted and then they sent out the ones who the Lord had already called so God does the work in the hearts now Moses and Joshua warned the people about their potential departure from the Lord. Let's look at, uh, again, Deuteronomy chapter 8, but verses 11 and following. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 8, 11 to 14, if somebody would read that for me, please. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 through 14. And think about Thou forgetting not the Lord thy God, in not keeping his commandments, and his judgment, and his status, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten, and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwell therein, 
And when thy health and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So what warnings apply to us as we look at Israel, which uh, the New Testament tells us are examples for us? What do you think out of that passage? Success. So when, when things are going great, Terry, yeah. Success. Yeah, we get on our knees when we have calamity, don't we? <laughs> um, and so the problem is, and in this case, verse 14 says, your heart be lifted up, again, being prideful, and then forgetting what God had done. He's the one who led in verse 15, verse 16, who fed. And you say in your heart, verse 17, my power and the power of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. <laughs> wow, we become so quickly complacent and so quickly forgetful of what God has done. Uh, turn with me to Joshua too, um, if you will. Joshua 24, and as you turn there, you, you will recognize that chapter as being the end of Joshua's life. And uh, verse 14, this is an amazing chapter. Um, now therefore fear the Lord, Joshua 24, 14, and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And of course then he gives the testament of his home and family who he would serve with his family. Look at verses 20 and 21. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, nay is a good way for saying no way, right? But we will serve the Lord. And over and over and over they say, we will serve the Lord. Verse 16, verse 18, verse 21. This is a good mid-year check, right? How many things did we promise God at the beginning of the year? And where are we today? How are we doing? Uh, maybe you need to go back and look those up. Um, I write them in a journal, so that's a good point for me to go back and check. And I'm not doing one of them. I love hearing our orchestra, but my trumpet is silent and stuck. I haven't played it. I was supposed to play it 10 minutes every day this year. I've got a lot of hours to catch up. <laughs> got to do that. Um, what have we promised and not fulfilled? Now Jesus spoke of how easy it is to be lost. Do you remember in, in Luke chapter 15? Do you remember the first lost item? I had one out of a hundred. A sheep. And then the lost one out of ten. A coin. And then in the father's house is a little trickier. I would like to say, I used to say 50% lost. But I say 100% lost. One just happened to stay at home and the other one left. But they were both gone from fellowship and with, with the Lord. Two lost sons, prodigal and the elder brother. So what, what, does, what do those stories about lostness and what we read here in, in Hosea chapter 2 tell us about a life that is lived apart from God? Doesn't end well. Doesn't go well. <laughs> and it, it leaves... It's hard. It's hard. And it leaves... Um, the only word coming to me is in Spanish. So, cicatrices, Marla? Scars, thank you. <laughs> uh, we communicate a lot that way uh, through our brains. 
but uh, <laughs> the, the fruit of 50, 52 years coming up of marriage, and I'm thankful for my sweetheart. Uh, by the way, thank you for praying for her. Uh, she had her first full night of sleep last night mm -hmm. in the bed in the last two or three months. Mm -hmm. So when I wake up and she's still there, I've got, whoa, <laughs> this is something. So thank you for, for that. Um, and, and so there can be scars when we disobey. There can be um, lives that are wrecked because of what we do. And so we have to be careful that we do not leave the Father's house. And if we are in this Father's house, we don't become bitter and resentful towards our God. Just remember, we're always just one step away from leaving that sweet fellowship that we have with our Lord. Now Hosea paints a picture of infidelity. It's plain speech and it's unpleasant. I wrote them down and I hate even reading them. So the word whoredom is not a pleasant word. And whoredoms mentioned 14 times. Lovers, six times. Harlots, three times. Adultery, and, and so on. Indecency. All these words, why, why did the Holy Spirit use these? I mean, think, think of the original <laughs> translators having to put this in King James English back in that day. <laughs> it was not, I imagine there were a few arguments going on. <laughs> this is not appropriate, but it is God speaking, and he is the one who authored these words. And so we have to be careful, don't we? Now, the Lord Jesus used pretty plain speech, didn't he? In Matthew 15, out of the heart, proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, faults, witness, blasphemies. Oh, I can't hear. Um, please excuse me. Yes. Uh, I can't hear, but think that we do not realize when we depart from the Lord, mm -hmm. we are committing spiritual adultery. Mm hmm and I heard one preacher say that that's also grounds for divorce. Mm. If, a, if a spouse just leaves the Lord totally and mistreats his wife, then that's grounds for divorce. Just the most physical mm. adultery. Yeah. So and grounds, but... I've never heard many sermons preached about spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's we, what this whole book's about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gene. And, we and think about it that way. And I think, too... Yes, grounds for dis divorce, but grace. So <laughs> we see Hosea doing what God did with his people um, who were proud, self-righteous, thought pragmatically everything's going well, um, but it was not. Actually, Jeroboam II, uh, things were going pretty well. People had money in the bank. They're, everything was going pretty well. But what was coming down the pike? That, that they're warned about. You're going to be taken into slavery. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to be almost annihilated as a nation. And so Hosea is, is given to the people, as is Amos a little bit later, to warn them. And the attitude of Israel, I, I think, if you'll go with me to Hosea chapter 12, and thank you, Gene, and feel free to pitch in. We're, we're all learning together. So I appreciate your liberty there. So in Hosea 12, verse 8, and Ephraim, now who's Ephraim? Israel, right? Just another word for Israel. Said, yet I, have, I am become rich. I have found me out substance in all my labors. They shall find none iniquity in me that were sinned. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing great, so I must not be sinning. I must be good, right? But we know according to Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 and 13, the word of the Lord is quick or alive and what? Powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, whether it be a sword or the sacrificial knife. It had to be sharp on both sides piercing even to the dividing asunder of what two parts? Soul. The soul. So the, the 
Some people use the, the human mind, heart, psyche, and then the spirit, our spirit was made alive when we came to Christ. It is dead before salvation. And then he mentions two physical parts, the joints and the marrows, and we don't like to talk about that, uh, those who've had surgeries. Um, but an illustration of what the, the, the work of the spirit, the word of God, does because it is a discerner of the thoughts. Do we plan? Yes, we do. Uh, my, my son's a far better planner than I am. He just went on his date yesterday with his sweetheart for their quarterly planning session. Evaluation of the first, of the second quarter of the year and, and then projecting into the, the next quarter. I admire that. Um, I'll do it someday when I get older. Uh, so the thoughts or plans and intents, that's the motivations of the heart. That's what the Spirit does with the Word of God. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight, but all things are naked. The Spirit uses interesting words. Fully exposed and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Wow. <laughs> we walk with a wonderful Lord. And He, for some reason, walks with us. And uh, it, it is amazing. So what does the Word accomplish in your life as you read it? What about when you hear it? Um, we are in a more reserved culture than I'm used to in Africa and uh, in South America. And uh, Pastor Jerry will mention it, you know, to get Baptists to raise their hands. And I'm, I'm not for going all the way down the other routes that some uh, worship services do. But uh, I'm telling you, we need to be, be free to speak out and say amen and say oh me when, when God works in our hearts. And, and it's an interesting thing in the Bible. Idolatry always leads to what? Immorality. It, it is, it's just categoric. So Isaiah, who was a contemporary of, of Hosea, at least for part of his life, uh, preached judgment on those who had lost their spiritual and moral compass. And as I look at our nation and, and watch the bad news or... Um, in Isaiah it says, Woe to them that call evil good, and good evil. And put darkness for light, and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. We're getting the message, right? Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. So 2024, everything's upside down. It just seems that way. And in Hosea, he echoes that and says they consider not in their hearts. And he used a lot of word pictures. We'll look at some next week. But he, he mentions that they're like a silly dove just flitting from one place to another. They call to Egypt, Assyria. And look at, look at uh, chapter 4 of Hosea, verses 11 and 12, where wine and new wine take away the heart. Verse 12. My people ask counsel at their stocks. And that's just another word for their wooden idols. And their staff declare to them. For the spirit of whoredoms have caused them to err, and they've gone a whoring from under their God. So Israel had become idolatrous, immoral, corrupt, violent, proud, politically entangled, hopelessly confused, and bent on backsliding and increasing in evil. They sin more and more. They've made, made molten images and idols according to their own understanding. They're craftsmen, but not for the Lord. They're just, they're just bent on, on, on uh, idolatry. And they mix it all up. So they, they even use words like this. Let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. What are they talking about? No, not a part of your anatomy. They're talking about the, the molten calves that, that had been built and set up in Dan and in Bethel. 
and they're like the chaff that is driven by the whirlwind and smoke out of a chimney. So the only hope for Israel was what? Chapter 14, verse 1. And we will get to, there, get to that point eventually when we look at chapters 11 and 14. O Israel, 14.1, do what? Return. Another word for that is what? Repent. Right. Return, repent to the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take your words. We call that confession. And turn, again, repentance to the Lord and say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So we will render another word for sacrifice of our lips. So our words should represent the humility of our hearts. The, the, the conduct of ourselves then will be affected by what we are thinking. It was Solomon. I don't need to go into the story because you know it well. 700 wives, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. When he was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And then it mentions them. And if you've done any studies into the ancient idols, Ashtoreth, Milcom, Chemosh, Molech, where they actually sacrificed human sacrifices to these images. And here we have the third king, the wisest man in Israel, following, yes, perhaps he just burned incense, but his heart was turned from God. Is it any wonder that we are able to read the book of Ecclesiastes, right? And so we read that in, in Hosea 2.5, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, my drink. So what are they saying? Israel was saying, We've gotten everything that we have by our own will and by the help of our idols. And God says, you're so wrong. <laughs> That's not it. For I gave her corn and wine and oil, multiplied her silver and gold, which they have prepared for Baal. So what did they do? Out of God's provision, they accumulated it and went and offered to Baal the sacrifice of what God had given them. And we just have to be careful also, don't we? <laughs> you remember Elijah's contest with the prophets? Do you remember the predominant idol? Baal, the rain god. <laughs> uh, three and a half years, he didn't produce, did he? And then the, the slaughter of these prophets. And so we find the condemnation is against Israel because in Hosea chapter 4 verse 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Chapter 8 verse 4, of their silver and gold if they made them idols. Verse 6, the workmen made it and therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased altars. According to the goodness of his hand of the land, they have made them goodly images. Does that goodly ring a bell to you? Achan picked up a goodly Babylonian garment. We have to be careful what our eyes are attracted to. And they sacrificed to Balaam. That's just plural of Baal. And burned incense to graven images. And they sinned more and more and made molten images of their silver and idols. Neither will we say any more to our work, ye are our gods. That will happen one day. And so religious apostasy and immorality led them to also reject God when it came to needing help. And so who did they turn to? Israel who was under God, theocracy, who had had the example of Eli and his ungodly sons. Samuel, who came along as a shining light, but his sons also perverted judgment. And they asked for a king to judge us like other nations. Samuel was downhearted. 
<laughs> they've rejected me. No, God said, no, they've rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They have forsaken me and served other gods, so they also do to thee. So the Lord must have our affections. The Lord must be first place in our lives. I don't know if I've shared with you, but I had two friends I respected greatly, and they just, I'm going to use the word, they worshiped their wives. I mean that in a good sense. The ground they walked on, they both became widowers. Mm -hmm. I do not judge that. I just am careful. <laughs> I love my wife. She is the only one in my life, and I thank God for her. But I only worship God. I only worship God. We have to be careful even in our affections. We sometimes think a president will come along and it will be the greatest thing. Sooner or later, it's not going to be there. We have to be careful as we select a servant leader of our church, don't we? I cringe a little bit when I hear somebody referred to a servant of God as hitting something out of the ballpark. I'm sorry, but I do. That's looking at man, not God. And so we have to pray. We cannot allow anything or anyone to take God's glory. Amen. And how to prevent that is to spend a lot of time in prayer. Just get on our knees, admit to God who we are, and confess the alliances that we often make with the enemy in one way or another, and how the deceptiveness of our hearts allows us to stray in our affections towards Him, and ask Him and beg Him to reveal to us by His Holy Spirit that we may then confess and be right before Him. Isaiah said, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord in whose hope the Lord is. Amen. And in that same passage, he says, Be careful because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So will you pray for me? Pray for other servants of the Lord who minister the Word. Pray for Pastor Miller. Pray for each other. And pray for our church in this time. And uh, continue in, in unity. We can do that with our words. We can do that in our prayers. We can do that in our actions. And be thankful for what God has done in the past. Look forward to what He's going to do in the future and in the present. Just be thankful that He's the one in charge. Let's bow our hearts. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that we've been reminded today that there are things worth fighting for, and that is the gospel. Thank you for the message, the truth that Christ died on the cross for us, was buried and rose again. Thank you for the promise of his coming. And in the meantime, Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to honor you with our lives. Continue, Father, to work. We implore you, we beg you in our hearts, first of all, so that we can then uh, share the truth with others. Thank you for this uh, difficult book, for a life that you called upon one of your servants to live and to show uh, the state of the nation. And so as we also look around and, and wonder exactly what you are doing, we are thankful that you hold the future and help us then to be faithful witnesses in the present. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.